And welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to hear about um, our presentation, Are You Ready for the Upcoming Respiratory Season? Presented by Dr. Garr. And as a quick reminder, Alliant is the quality improvement organization for the seven states highlighted here. Um, Dr. Gar is our medical director here at Alliant, and we are pleased to have her present today. And Dr. Gar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicole. All right, so lots of objectives in the in this objective slide, but I can tell you there are two things that we are going to talk about, and I'm so excited about this presentation today. And they, Nicole, and the team have heard about how excited I am, so I can't contain my excitement as a medical director. So there are two things that I really want to talk about, and I um, hope that you guys are as excited as I am by the time we get finished with this presentation. I would love for you to chat in, uh, you know, what your responsibility and role is in, um, in your facility. If you're an infection preventionist, I want to know that. Um, so that I can I can know like who all you know participated in this event and were so excited like I am. Um, so um, that being said, there are two things that we're going to talk about. One is we're going to talk about threat analysis. You know how do you assess the threat of respiratory viral illness? Because as you know, you know you are hearing everywhere, and I am hearing everywhere. You know um, there is that triple demic again. Um, that we are worried about, which means infection with COVID, flu, and RSV going around at the same time. So we are going to talk about, you know, where where do I find out, like where what my facility um, is going to face at any current at any moment, right? So we're going to talk about that. And then the other thing that we are going to talk about is a comprehensive strategy to create safety for our patients and our staff. So those are the two big items we're going to talk about. And so let's let's um, start talking about it. So the number one question that I want to ask you is, are there any websites that you check to assess the risk of outbreaks? So if you can type it into the chat, even, you know, I, you don't have to put the whole um, website uh, link, but um, even if you can say, I look at, a, you know, this website, that website, I want to see in the, in the chat, if there are any favorite websites that you have favorited to kind of assess that risk of outbreaks in your facility, whether it be COVID or flu or, um, or, you know, RSV or any other illnesses. So I am seeing CDC. That's a good answer. Um, and I see that we have several infection preventionists. Do we have any DONs um, or administrators? Yes, I, I love that. Great. Um, keep those chats coming. I do love that CDC, um, you know, CDC website. Um, that you have, yes, yeah, CDC data tracker. I love that. Okay, so we are going to show you the websites that you want to have. Okay, so the first one is, as you guys pointed out, the CDC COVID data tracker. It makes me so happy that you guys actually said CDC data tracker. Really cool website. I'm going to go over the elements that you want to kind of go click, 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 and look. That's great. Um, and then the second one is the NHSN COVID-19 LTC report. You know, I would totally uh, make sure that I, um, you know, favored that as well, because, you know, that's that's really what is going on in the long-term care facilities. Um, and then the other one, the new, the new one that you want to um, basically um, uh, put put a star on is um, the cdc.gov surveillance. It's called RESPnet. You, if you just type in RESP NET, it's going to show up. So make sure that you favor that because it has, and I'm going to show it to you what it has. But that is the newer website that they came up with, and that is super, super helpful. And then, of course, Medicare Care Compare. And the reason why I'm saying Medicare Care Compare is it is starting to show your COVID-19 vaccine rates. And, um, you know, as you keep putting in the flu rates, you know, they might start showing up there as well. So 
make sure that your rate, you look at your rate of care compare and you look at your internal rates because they should match, right? If they are not matching, you want to know that and I will tell you why. So th these are the four websites. I think they are super, super important for you to have um, in order to, you know, assess the, you know, threat, um, do a threat analysis on um, what is happening in your neck of the woods uh, and what is happening, you know, what kind of threat do your patients have against, you know, uh, from these um, respiratory illnesses. Okay. That being said, let's uh, jump into the first one, CDC COVID-19 data tracker. We have talked about it. And many of you said that this is something that you've already favorited. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, okay. So this is um, a little different um, face of the, you know, when you put in COVID, uh, COVID data tracker, they have done some cool work over there. Um, on CDC, because now they are clearly saying what are the early indicators and what are the severity indicators, right? So early indicators are basically test positivity, which, you know, we have talked about test positivity. There was a time when every single test was basically kind of getting fed into the Department of Public Health system or some kind of system. Remember the, the time when we were all, all we were doing was PCR and then, you know, came the antigen test and now people are doing antigen tests and they are, they don't have to report. So you don't really have a good idea on test positivity. So I would definitely take it with a grain of salt. The proxy indicators for those are emergency department visits, right? As your emergency department visits start to go up, you got to get start getting worried, right? Um, and then the other, the severity, there are two severity indicators. There are other indicators of test positivity, and I'll tell you in two seconds, but um, the severity indicators are hospitalization and death. So when you go on the CDC data tracker home, this is what is going to, this is the banner that's going to show up at the top. If you do nothing else, just look at that, right? And what you're seeing is the first thing that's going to go up out of these indicators, right? The first thing that's going to go up is test positivity. The second thing that's going to go up after that with a little bit of lag is emergency department visits with a little bit of lag, hospitalization. And finally, that death lags. Why? Because, you know, people who are coming into the emergency department may or may not get hospitalized. The severity indicators kind of show the hospitalization and those people in the hospital are getting treated, right? They are doing their very best to make sure that, they are providing, you know, the, in the hospital, they are getting good care. But then, you know, if if the disease severity is very high, like it wasn't Delta variant, then you start to see the deaths. And that's why there's a little bit of a lag, right, from test positivity to the death indicator. So, um, so expect that to happen. The other thing that you notice, if you notice in the left bottom, it says wastewater is also an early indicator. Wastewater surveillance is the earliest indicator of what is going to happen in your community, whether it's the rates going up or the rates going down. That's that's your lead, lead, lead indicator. So always remember to look at that because I can tell you, it's really it's it's really important for me to know that wastewater is gonna go up and I will show you in two seconds, but it's also really, really good to see that going down. When I'm in the throes of COVID, you know, everybody is, you know, we are having so many outbreaks and I'm pulling my hair out. It's just good to see that it's going to start to go down. And I'll show you in a second. This is important. This tells us what the variants that are circulating are. Why is it important? One is, you know, and if you have come to my talks, I will talk to you about it all the time. The more colorful and the more the colors are changing in this ribbon, um, the more the higher the chance of outbreak right if you get new colors in this ribbon your chances of outbreak are going to be higher why because the new colors are indicative of new um sub variants of omicron and when there are new sub variants of omicron going around in your community they're literally looking for people to infect and so you're going to have that peak in um you're going to have those infections and then once these colors are out and about, um, you know, so for example, this tan, it has been out and about for a little bit, you start to see that 
lull that, you know, it infected whoever it needed to infect. And the rest of them were, you know, had good immunity either through immunization or previous recent previous infections or whatever. But at the end of the day, that is what it is going to show you. The other thing is, these are the so these are the strains now that are circulating and it's fall. So, you know, it does our vaccine, the new updated vaccine support uh, covering, uh, you know, safety, provide safety against these. The answer to that is yes. And we're going to get into it in two seconds. Okay, today I don't have wastewater surveillance, but know that, you know, if you have come to my talk in the past, wastewater surveillance is the one that I totally um, nerd out on. It is so cool to see. And when you're looking at wastewater surveillance, what you want to see is not just what is happening in your neck of the woods. You're going to see the change, 15-day change. It has a little area where you can click the 15-day change. And if the 15-day change is showing you a lot of red, be aware and be wary um, because that means that the change is going the wrong direction. Blue is good. Red is bad. You know that. And then contiguous areas, right? You know, if I'm in Georgia, which I am, I am looking at what is happening in Alabama, what is happening in Florida, what is happening in North Carolina, South Carolina area, um, because I know what happens in the surrounding areas kind of comes in here. Um, so I'm always looking at, you know, what is happening, you know, in a wider area than um, just my neck of the woods, right? Okay, so this is the one that I was talking about, is the, uh, the rest net right you know it shows you the combined numbers which are the black and then the red one is covid numbers and then and dashed red is the new season uh, is the old season and the solid line is the new season so basically what you are seeing here is black is the combined numbers red is uh, the covid numbers blue is the flu numbers and green is your RSV numbers. So here you get a comprehensive threat analysis on what may be going on in your neck of the woods. And I think it is so, so, so important for you to know this. This is your biggest help in threat analysis. Now, these are surveillance numbers from hospitalization. So know that, again, it is a proxy measure and not the real measure of what is going on. You may be, uh, you may go into flu surveillance. If you type in flu surveillance CDC, CDC will tell you state by state what is happening in the flu numbers, which is super helpful because it's, it is influenza like illness. That's the other good um, website that I would have. But this is important. And I will tell you that what we are seeing right now is the COVID numbers are starting to come down. If you look on the very left side, um, you are seeing those numbers uh, right now are um, starting to come down. And then the blue line is kind of staying super flat right now. So the flu activity is sort of low, but what has started to go up is the RSV activity. So just know that this is what it shows and follow that along um, as you continue to look at the threat to your facility. Okay, so we talked about how do we find out what is happening with COVID because if you go in, this look at the cumulative cases and the cumulative cases really lately have been all almost COVID. When the red line and the black line are meeting, that means most of the cases, all out of all respiratory illnesses, COVID is almost going and, um, and basically is the one that is contributing to almost all the numbers. You know, if you look at July, August, that's what was going on. All the cases of respiratory illnesses that you were seeing in the hospital surveillance were COVID. And now, the, these lines start to depart. If you go end of September, the black line is is continuing to slightly go up. The COVID cases are starting to come down, but what is going up is RSV. So that is where you see the threat, right? Now, the other threat is the threat of death, right? So the one is threat of cases and the other one is the threat of getting really sick and dying. So 
One is let's prevent the outbreaks. We just talk about that threat. The second threat is let's also, if, if you have an outbreak, you want to prevent serious illness and death, right? So those are the two, two threats that we are going to assess and then mitigate, right? So if you look at this data, on the left side, the red bars are age by age, the number of cases that happen, right? So if you look at cases that happened in the population above 65 years of age, so the last three bars, right? 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and 85 plus. If you look at the cumulative cases, you see that the number of cases that are happening really are happening primarily in those 18 to 64 age group, right? You know, that's the that's where the bars are getting bigger on the red on the red side by the case. But look at what is happening on the death side. If you look at the deaths, which is on the right and the blue bars, right, you are seeing that disproportionately the deaths are higher in people who are almost more than 50 years of age or definitely 65 to 74. So while the cases may be lower, the deaths are higher. So certainly as a medical director, my goal is to narrow this blue gap, right? You know, just squish that down to as little as possible. Can I make a difference in the deaths, you know, in this 50 to 50 years and above age group. And we're gonna talk about that. So one is keep them from having the illness. The second is keep them from getting super sick. So those are our two goals that we identify in our facility. So this is what I'm so excited about. So, you know, when, as a medical director, what I have been doing before COVID is you know, wanting to do the best for my patients, but, you know, I did it in a very siloed way, right? You know, when flu came around, I'm like, let's all get vaccinated with flu. And then, you know, then the flu went away. You know, maybe I got to, you know, pneumonia and, you know, clearly um, tried to do it th that way. And everything was like, you know, piecemeal and, I was really not paying attention to how do you really, really mitigate the threats that we talked about, threat of getting the illness into your building and threat of, you know, people getting super sick and dying. And so I started to think about, you know, is there a way to create a comprehensive strategy which I can use against any kind of viral illness, right? Because all the viral illnesses have similar kind of transmission. And, and I want to have a comprehensive strategy that I'm able to hold in my head where I am, you know, really decreasing the threat pretty systematically, right? So this is why I got super excited about this, uh, you know, this little triangle, because it's like almost a tripod. So it's basically in the center is our goal protect against respiratory illnesses. And the three arms to it, you know, the triangle points are the strategies that we have to keep in mind. So what I would say is as a medical director, I've shifted away from kind of saying, oh, we need to give flu vaccine or, oh, we need to do this, um, you know, separately, right? And instead I have started thinking about how to create a safety strategy in a very comprehensive way. And I keep that triangle in my head and say, you know, how do I, um, you know, do it for flu or RSV or, you know, or COVID. So we're gonna talk about this. So here's what I'm here to tell you. When you are creating a safety strategy or that's your goal, then you have to think about all these three things at the same time. And if you thought of these three things, then you are gold. You may not have to think about anything else other than those three things. So these are the end all be all to create a great safety strategy against respiratory illnesses. So we're gonna talk about it. So let's see how this works. So let's talk about immunization real quick. Okay, so the first part of the safety strategy is immunization. Okay, 
Why should I care about immunization? So let's quickly talk about vaccine impact. Flu vaccine will actually decrease your rates of flu, right? Rates of flu will go down. It will also decrease the hospitalization. It's also going to decrease the severity of illness if a person gets flu, right? So it will decrease your numbers of flu, and then it's also going to decrease the severity of flu. Pneumonia vaccine, 76% effective against invasive disease, which will put people, invasive disease is the one that puts people in the hospital and, um, and increases the chance of dying. COVID vaccine, a five times lower risk of dying, sustained protection from ICU stay, clearly. And then RSV in high risk individual will do the same. So what are we getting out of that? We are getting decrease in healthcare acquired infections and bear with me for two seconds. We're gonna decrease in the number of antibiotics that we are using because they are not gonna get that invasive illness and we're not gonna have to use antibiotics. Decrease in hospitalization and decrease in death, right? We talked about squishing that blue bars. Here is how we're gonna squish those blue bars, right? Not just that. So these are patient related outcomes, right? It matters to our patients. However, your value-based purchasing, right? You know, um, one of the value-based purchasing measure that we are dealing with right now is 30-day readmissions, right? Because if we don't have good 30-day readmission compared to other facilities or we don't show improvement, we are disincentivized, right? And if we do that well, then we are incentivized. Well, there are more value-based purchasing um, um, elements that are coming in. One of them that we are already on the runway for is healthcare acquired infections, okay? So, which is the second one. Nursing home um, facility, healthcare associated infections requiring hospitalizations. So we, in 2026, that's gonna become a full on, you know, value-based purchasing um, incentive disincentive where we are right now with the first measure, right? Skilled nursing facility, readmission measure, a 30 day readmission, that's the first one. The second one is gonna be healthcare acquired infection. Then the nursing home facility, 30 day readmission is going to um, change into within stay, potentially preventable. This is potentially preventable. And then also the fourth one that is going to come in into play is the number of hospitalization per thousand long stay resident days. So you will have, by having a great vaccine program, you're going to not just provide patient safety, but you're also going to be able to affect these value-based purchasing measures that are directly going to affect your bottom line, right? You got to pay attention to that. How do we pay attention to that? We, what we don't talk about doesn't move, right? So we bring it into our antimicrobial stewardship meetings. We bring it into our copy meetings. So think about this strategy, take this slide and like really study, you know, it, I have put in a lot of effort and by implementing that in my facility, we have been able to move numbers. And I think, you know, that is going to be a very, very important piece moving forward to create safety and also to win, get a win in the value-based purchasing measures. Okay, quick uh, point about uh, staff vaccination. Staff vaccination will reduce flu among your healthcare workers, will reduce work absences. I don't know of a facility who can afford people to be out. You know, we are really stretched thin and this is a great strategy to be able to mitigate those work absences and it protects the patient. It actually has better outcomes in patients if you have a highly vaccinated staff. So, Clearly, better for the staff, staff health, which I really care about, better for your facility logistics, better for the staff member's family, better for your patient's outcomes. And the other thing is the right side. This is what people are saying. 50 um, percentage of adults age 50 to 80 who reported flu vaccination should be definitely required for various groups in the nursing home. So basically 50 to 80 years of age, people in their survey are saying 73% of, you know, basically 73% of people are saying 
that you should definitely require for all medical staff, right? And 71% for non-medical staff. And non-medical staff is non-nursing staff, right? You know, non-direct healthcare um, staff. So clearly people are looking at it. And this further goes on to say is that people are actually checking Care Compare, and that's why I put Care Compare in the in in your sites that you need to have. And basically, they said that this is going to um, be, um, help them choose the facility. So they are looking at um, staff vaccination rates, and they are choosing facility based upon that. But because there is a strong data that staff vaccination affects the patient outcomes in these illnesses. Okay, so we talked about value-based purchasing. We talked about the quality reporting program. Make sure that you are putting in those quality reporting and checking it against your um, care compare. Okay, so influenza, I'm gonna quickly go over it because we have talked and talked and talked about it. But basically the update in influenza is anybody over 65 years of age gets high dose flu vaccine or adjuvanted flu vaccine. And I'm going to give you a slide that tells you what vaccines you know there are um, that should be given for over 65 years of age. COVID-19, the updated vaccine is one and done for most part, uh, unless the patient is immunocompromised by CDC definition. There are not very many people in that group, but if they are, they need total three. And I have included that schedule as well. RSV has to be a shared clinical decision-making, but I will tell you that you should strongly consider RSV vaccination as well. Now, one note about influenza vaccine for people old, older than 65 years of age. I have listed the vaccines that are um, that should be given. Now, if you don't have that, don't keep them from getting a vaccine. Give them the regular dose if you cannot procure a high dose, but don't keep them from having a vaccine. Some protection is better than no protection. So this is going to be an important take home message. Clearly, these are the vaccines that you want to um, you want to have this choice. Okay, quick update on the updated COVID-19 vaccine. Basically, this is the local reaction, systemic reaction. There are studies that are showing that the updated vaccines are comparable. The side of the, the effects, I don't call them side effects because that's your immunity wrapping up and you need to, you, that's normal. That's normal, that's normal effect. It's actually a good thing, but don't be miserable, right? If your patient, so this is what we did. We are, we did our big um, COVID uh, vaccine campaign. And, um, and basically here's what I said. As the moment that somebody says, I'm having body aches or I'm having pain here, they're gonna probably have it for two straight days. Don't give them just one Tylenol. Give them, you know, maybe Tylenol three times a day or twice a day for the next two days. Don't let them be miserable. Don't make it PRN. If they are having the reaction, that, that means their body is revved up, their immunity is good to go. And one note, even if you don't have your reaction, the immunity is happening. Some people just, the immunity just comes and tells them that I am revving up. If that is happening, don't keep them miserable. They will never take the vaccine again. Make sure that you cover them with Tylenol and round the clock Tylenol. Um, ask your doctors to give that order for two straight days. Typically it lasts about two days, two and a half days, and then they are good to go. So make sure that people don't suffer with these normal reactions that they are having, right? So it showed that the updated vaccine is comparable to the previous one. Uh, now there are some people, we just came off of a COVID outbreak if you had COVID and now you're going to get the vaccine, likely your, your immunity is going to rev up real good and you may have more side effects. So make sure, again, don't keep them miserable. Cover them. This is not something that doesn't go away with Tylenol. Simple, simple fix. Um, this is basically telling you quite a bit fold increase against the current variant. So we are excited about that. This is a good vaccine. Against, again, the recommendation is one and done. One thing. Novavax is available for your staff and your residents who do not want to take a mRNA vaccine. Novavax is built exactly like the flu vaccine. So for people who have taken the flu vaccine who say, I'm not sure about the mRNA vaccine, although 
all my kids, everyone has taken the mRNA vaccine. We don't have a tail or whatever. But that being said, if somebody has an issue with the mRNA vaccine, offer them the Novavax, okay? So that's important. Novavax has also updated their formula to match with the current variants that we are anticipating. So you are going to be good to go. This is the schedule. I'm not going to talk about it, but you know, this is the schedule for immunocompromised people. Note on RSV vaccine, um, nursing home residents are increased risk for severe RSV disease, especially your frail ones, severe uh, CHF and COPD. You can give the vaccines all at the same time, no problem. This is something that we have talked about. Make sure that you have a comprehensive vaccine program. If you want to know more about that, chat it in and I will come back and talk about this. But you have to have a full comprehensive program. Infection prevention and control is the other facility mapping. This is something that we're gonna talk about in the next talk. Uh, more comprehensively here, my only thing is two people next to each other is different from two people in two different units and you have to map your infections. You cannot tell flu versus COVID versus RSV when the season comes around, you want to test them for all three, flu, COVID, RSV, right? Because you can have all of them at the same time. Here is the COVID. COVID has a different um, uh, transmission-based precaution than flu and RSV. Make sure that you're using the right one. That's because it's transmitted differently. And then lastly, a word about therapeutics. These are the recommendations. Consider Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, Remdesivir. And here are all your basically um, considerations for Paxlovid. And flu, make sure that you have, you consider having, make sure that you have that supply of Tamiflu or know where you're gonna get it from. Because you have to start treatment early. Any viral illness got to start the treatment early. The earlier you start the treatment, the better your outcomes are gonna be. So always make sure. Veloxivir, you can give for treatment. If you don't have Tamiflu, you cannot give in nursing home for prevention you only give Tamiflu for prevention. And this is a way that we made sure that you have a comprehensive program for treatment as well. Make sure that you are providing them with supportive treatment, incentive parameter is great, um, and others, but um, here is your comprehensive program. Who should get notified and how are we going to make sure that we are um, uh, increasing our surveillance, testing, and COVID protocol, and, and our protocols. So these are the people who get notified and what are they supposed to do once they get notified? All right, any questions or anything that you guys want me to come back and talk about in more details, please chat it in, put it in the Q&A. And I think I am close to the end of um, the time. So any questions that you would like for me to kind of go back and talk about, please chat it in. Otherwise, if you want me to come back, that that is something that we can certainly do as well. Dr. Gar, you do still have about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, you did not see any questions come through the chat with the exception of can they print the presentation and just to answer that verbally, the link is in the chat to the presentation and you can print it that way. Um, but no other questions. Good. Well, since we don't have any other questions, and I thought that because of the chats that were coming through that I was at the end of the presentation, just a small note about this. Your, if you are an infection preventionist, please make a copy of your facility map. Anytime um, you have, um, you have an, um, a person with the um, symptoms, you got to map it on your facility. This is basically uh, the map on the left is telling me that there is probably a stat, you know, a local outbreak of some some illness, right? So we need to treat this. This is different. 
this is where I'm going to be worried about, is there a staff member who may be positive versus on the right where there, there could be random infections going on? Okay. So, and once you have this situation happen, here is what you need to do, right? You need to up your surveillance. Somebody needs to go down and start asking people if they have, inf you know, if they have any symptoms, right? And then, um, the other thing that I wanted to Dr. Gar, other, yes. apologies. You did have a few questions come through. Since we have the okay. time, I'd like to make sure we get them addressed. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, the first one is, are there rapid RSV tests? Are there rapid? Um, no, I think what you're looking for is the flu COVID RSV. It's a PCR test, typically. All right. The next one says, I have been getting a lot of feedback that once a person gets COVID, they no longer need the vaccine. Can you address this? Oh, for sure. Thank you. That was a great question. So if you do get COVID, you're likely to get COVID. So a couple of things, right? One is if you do have COVID, there are always, COVID is always kind of reinventing itself, COVID virus. So just because you had COVID because of, with one variant doesn't, you know, the, the protection is sporadic and the protection, um, we don't know how long the protection lasts, right? So it may not be able to cover the new variant, just the previous infection. The other thing is, it really depends on how sick you got in the first time around. So if you got really sick, then likely you really made a lot of antibodies, but that really sick means you were in the ICU or in the hospital. And you really don't want to do that. Regardless of that, the protection with the vaccine is actually more predictable and has been shown to be decreasing even after almost a year of, you know, getting your booster. It's still showing that decrease in death and decrease in serious illness in the, in the ICU stays. So, I would definitely highly recommend getting the vaccine. That's number one. And because it's very tailored to the uh, upcoming variants. The second thing is um, long COVID, right? In young people who are not as you know likely to be admitted to the ICUs, they are getting long COVID, right? And the vaccine is going to protect you against long COVID. So that's those are the two areas. The other is, like in flu, COVID vaccine and highly vaccinated staff members are that first line of treatment, the first line of defense against a COVID infection coming in and starting to affect your older adult population who may not be able to have that high immunity, right? So it's a good thing all the way around. Um, if you give multiple vaccines and they have adverse reaction, how would you know? Oh, this is a great question as well. So I'm glad that I quickly zipped through that, right? Because I thought that I was at the end of the presentation and I was talking. Um, if you are giving the high dose flu vaccine and if you're giving the COVID vaccine at the same time, you want to give different arms. So, so you would know, right? So that is what we basically did the last time around. We gave high dose flu vaccine and COVID vaccine. Now, if you are somebody like me who got my COVID my regular dose flu vaccine, and my COVID vaccine both on the same arm, I was fine. So because regular dose flu vaccine and COVID, you know, you really have studies which kind of tell you that it's not a significant amount of reaction you're gonna have. Again, if somebody is having a lot of local reaction, I would do warm compress or, oh, sorry, cool compress. I would give them Tylenol and then I would um, give them maybe Benadryl for, you know, um, just for the day. And that kind of takes care of that. Um, but yes, good question. High dose flu vaccine and COVID, do it in different arms. Feedback about pricing for COVID vaccine. Is this insurance covered? Yes, 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 yes. Great question. So especially relevant for your staff members. So basically, if you have insurance, you should be fully covered for your vaccines, fully covered for your COVID vaccine. Insurance companies should not charge you a copay. You should be fully covered for your vaccine. That's number one. Number two is if you don't have insurance, if anybody doesn't have insurance, there is a CDC 
Bridge Program. Just type in CDC Bridge Program on Google, B-R-I-D-G, like a bridge um, on a river. So CDC has a bridge program that will cover the cost of vaccine for people who do not have insurance. And so please, please, please tell your staff insurance should not, like copay should not be a consideration on the COVID vaccine at all. So that is an important, important consideration. Thank you for asking that question. All right, any other questions? Oh, thank you, Nicole. Nicole has put that in the chat. Any other questions that we can answer? I'm trying to think of anything. Oh, one interesting thing I will tell you, you know, you will be hearing this and I just want to just come out and tell you why these two are different. COVID-19 virus kind of travels through really, really small particles, right? Really small particulate stuff. Those particles hang around in the atmosphere. They are not droplets that are big enough that kind of go, you cough and they land, right? They come in really small particles and they hang around in the atmosphere. When these particles are really small and they hang around, that's why we need a really well tight mask, uh, which is your N95 and your face shield, because think about it, COVID, COVID virus is hanging around. You wanna cover yourself with a really, really good mask. And then you wanna cover your eyes because they are conjunctiva with your face shield. That's why the, you know, the requirement is different. The transmission-based precautions are different. Flu and RSV, they are on big droplets. Big droplets, what do they do? They come out of your mouth or your nose and they go land somewhere, right? They land somewhere. So you have to, you can get by with a regular mask, right? That's why CDC says, N95 on this side, and it, you know you can get by with a regular mask, but you gotta really wash your hands because it's everywhere. It landed, it landed everywhere. It landed on the bed rails, it landed on the door handles. Wash your hands when you go in, wash your hands when you get out. So make sure, and then it's gonna land on your clothes if the patient is going to cough on you. So that's why you should wear a gown, right? So that's why there are two different um, ways, uh, two different precautions for two, you know, for di different illnesses. There is a science behind it, and that's so cool. So make sure that you are um, um, you are following that. But know that when people have respiratory symptoms, you cannot tell. So you, and they may have both together. They may have COVID and flu together. I've had patients who have had COVID and flu together, believe it. So um, don't just assume that this person has COVID or flu. You know, you just have to, you know, make sure that you're testing them for all three when it is going around in your community. And that is going to be told to you by threat analysis, right? What is going around in the community, so just wanted to make sure that we talked about that. Well, any other questions? Nothing else has come through. Awesome, well, thank you. This was fun. Thank you. Um, and this slide here just shows an additional work that Alliant is involved in for the 12th scope of work. And if you do have any additional questions, please reach out to Julie Kleeker, Kieker, excuse me, for Alabama, Florida, and Louisiana, and Leanne Sauls for Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Tennessee. And that is a wrap for today's presentation. Please visit Alliant on the four, four social media websites here. We do have a Facebook, a Twitter, now known as X, a LinkedIn, and a YouTube. Thank you again for being with us today. And thank you, Dr. Garr, for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you. It was um, great to talk to you all.